The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm attorney Robert Barnes. I represent the appellants, Kata Lindsay, the Peace and Freedom Party, and Richard Becker. In 2012, Kata Lindsay and the Peace and Freedom Party and Richard Becker wanted to submit her name to be nominated as a potential nominee of the Peace and Freedom Party for the presidency of the United States. But she's clearly ineligible for that office. That would be a decision for Congress to make. And that is our assertion here. Because what happened here is, in fact, the procedural history is such that she submitted it. She was the election code 6041 provides that the secretary shall place a candidate on the ballot if they're generally recognized as a candidate. It was unquestioned that she was generally recognized as a candidate. The secretary then took the position, initially just denied it, did not know on February 6th. After court proceedings began, the secretary said that the reason was because of age. But the only document they could cite was something that was one week after the secretary had actually made her decision. But independent of that, the key question here is whether the secretary of state has the authority to interpret. So there's no dispute that she is underage, underage in terms of the constitutional standards. She is or was at that time less than 35, right? Yes, Your Honor, that is correct. Okay, so you said something in the beginning that sounded like you were disputing. But you're not disputing that. I'm not disputing that fact, Your Honor, no. Okay. What we are disputing is the secretary's authority to be the person to adjudicate, interpret, and enforce the qualifications provisions of the U.S. Constitution. But you mentioned something about the role of Congress in your response. Yes, Your Honor. The Constitution carefully creates a system whereby any dispute about the qualification of a person to hold the office of the presidency is determined by the 12th Amendment, the 20th Amendment. What does it say that's exclusive? The interpretation of it being exclusive is that Congress is the one that it's been delegated to. The question of whether another state official can act in that capacity is definitely a novel question. Now, in the context of adding qualifications, this Court determined in Schaefer v. Townsend that the California State Legislature cannot add qualifications to what was explicitly delegated to Congress. In the term limits case, it was determined that no additional qualifications could be added and that the elections clause gave Congress the preemptive right. But this is not an addition. This is a qualification that's in the Constitution itself. It is, Your Honor. But, for example, could the state of Arizona, which passed legislation or attempted to pass legislation that said a candidate had to have certain forms of documentary proof in order to meet the qualifications provision, would that statute be constitutional? In fact, many people would say that. That's a hypothetical question we don't need to deal with because, in this case, if you were saying, look, there's no proof that she is less than 35 and we're disputing the California's requirement that she prove up that she's less than 35, then we'd have that question. But we don't because you've already said you don't dispute she's less than 35. So how the Secretary came to that knowledge or what procedures she used or whether she could use any procedures is not before us. It's not something we need to decide right now. The key question is whether she has this authority in general. For example, in the instance of both the Robinson case and Robinson v. Bowen in the Northern District of California and in the California Appeals Court case in Keyes v. Bowen. I take it you can determine that it's a person, like somebody ran a dog for president. She would have a, I mean, let's say some party, not the Peace and Freedom Party, but some party nominated a dog for president. I take it the Secretary of State would have authority to keep that off the ballot, right? I believe that, too, would be submitted to Congress. And the reason for that is this. Because let's take the logical conclusion the other way. In the McCain case, it was undisputed that Senator McCain was not born inside the United States. One interpretation of the natural born provision of the clause of the Constitution was that required was required. Under the Secretary's interpretation, a future Secretary of State could have excluded Senator McCain from the ballot on her interpretation and application of that provision. For example, in the very birther laws that were being passed and still being considered by states across the country, they were going to require certain forms of documentation that it was undisputed that Senator Obama and then President Obama would not have been able to meet. Under this interpretation of what the district court allowed, a state official anywhere in the country could have excluded Mr. Obama from the ballot on the grounds that the interpretation of the natural born clause provision, he didn't suffice to meet a documentary proof. 
There's also another provision that the President can do. But, again, that's a question we would have if there are disputes now as to whether or not she meets the constitutional standard. But in this case, she doesn't dispute it. So, you know, if she said, look, 35 doesn't mean 35, 35 means 34 or 32, you know, for whatever reason, then – but she doesn't dispute it. She admits she doesn't meet the constitutional standard. She doesn't meet the standard to hold the office of presidency. I believe she does meet the standard to be President-elect. The 20th Amendment provides for a provision where it says if a President-elect does not. But that's different, right? That's different from the McCain situation, right? Because all the – or the Bertha – I mean, the examples you gave, those are all disputes about whether somebody meets the constitutional standard. But in this case, you've sort of given that up. You've said we admit she does not have the requirements under the Constitution to be President. So all these mechanics about, you know, what the State can do to figure that question out, not before us. No, but what is before us is whether the Secretary of State has the authority to make that determination. Well, let me ask you. Both the analysis conducted in the district court and the State's brief rely on case law discussing codified election regulations or laws. I'm just curious, does the analysis change because Ms. Bowen was not acting pursuant to a certain election law but under her discretion? Do we have to use the same test? I think the case is Anderson and Burdick, that those cases set out some tests. Do we use those tests? Your Honor, here I would say the Secretary of State has a higher burden because the California State legislature has never authorized this for her. They've never said unless a candidate is age 35, they're not allowed to be a candidate for presidency in California. No such law has actually been passed by the State of California. The Secretary of State's interpretation is that because she took an oath to the U.S. Constitution, she can interpret it, adjudicate it, and enforce it wherever she wants. Today we face these particular facts, but tomorrow we may face an entirely different set of facts. Well, what's the harm? Is there any harm for your client, the Peace and Freedom Party, when it has to place on the ballot a candidate who is 35 and older versus someone who's 27 years of age? Yes, Your Honor, because they're not being allowed the opportunity to have that issue or question if she were to be elected, submitted to Congress, and be submitted. And the 20th Amendment anticipates that someone can be a candidate for presidency, be qualified to be a candidate for presidency, and not be qualified to yet hold the office. Hence, the 20th Amendment says someone who has not qualified but may at some future point qualify. That clearly applies to someone that wouldn't fit the natural-born citizen provision. It likely wouldn't be the 14-year resident provision, which, by the way, that would be another provision. Election officials across the state could start to interpret different states in the country, provisions that could have excluded Eisenhower and other people from the presidential ballot if we're going to allow state officials to now interpret, adjudicate, and enforce constitutional qualification provisions for the presidency. So here, because she wasn't, what happens when a young candidate, for example, in the past, California has allowed underage candidates on the ballot or people who didn't qualify for office on the ballot. For example, in state legislative race cases, including in Leland, 127P643, McGee, 226P2-1, Fuller, 138, California Reporter 3rd, 396, a person who was clearly not a resident and didn't meet the residency qualifications to be run for California legislative office. It was challenged. The court said that neither the Secretary of State nor the county official nor the courts could determine whether or not that person was qualified. Qualifications of an elected official are best left to the elected body for a lot of very good and sound reasons. It may be easy to say, well, this age one is a simple one, so let's let it open. Let's open up Pandora's box just a little bit and see how it goes. But once it gets opened, all those other qualifications are going to come into question and state officials are going to start serving. What about segregating the obvious disqualification from those that are marginal, such as you suggested, the birther issue and so forth, where it's clear that age is expressed in the Constitution? What's the problem? I think the problem is that it always should be like the residency issue. Here there were several residencies. Well, I can understand residency, room for discussion. But when it's age, and this person was at that time eight years below eligibility, 
Two different reasons, Your Honor. First, I think the 20th Amendment provides for an underage president to be elected and not hold office. It allows the vice president instead or Congress to make a determination until they're qualified. It's almost the only reasonable thing. But she's not running for vice president. No, she isn't. But she would usually have a ticket and the vice president would be elected. So they anticipated this possibility and they left it to the public and to Congress to make a decision. And that's the best place to do it. Once we open the door and say executive officials can start to interpret the Constitution and apply it, even if it may seem simple and elementary. Well, it's one thing to say that they may have anticipated the problem of this arising. It's another thing to say that they're the only ones who have authority to deal with it. It's not clear to me why you say, well, look, if a state were to nominate somebody who is underage and they were to get elected, then Congress has tools to deal with it. But what precludes, what makes an exclusive remedy? Why can't state officials anticipate along the way and say, look, we don't want to create these kind of problems. We don't want to have a candidate from our state who gets disqualified. We know we'll get disqualified because. What the district court in the Northern District of California in the Robinson case, William Alsop, determined was that because it was the kind of question that should always be submitted to an elected body, at a minimum, that elected body should have the first choice. And given the 12th and 20th Amendment's role in a federal election, that it's too risky to give a state official any role in that process. The California Court of Appeals in Keys v. Bowen went further, where they said, quote, it would be a truly absurd result if every state election official could determine the qualifications of the criteria or whether they meet the eligibility criteria of the presidency. I would note the Secretary of State actually urged that position before the California Court of Appeals in 2010 when it was served its interest to do so. Here, there would be a second question independent of that first one about whether or not the Secretary of State should be afforded this power or is constitutionally or is under California legislation. Is here the only person the Secretary of State has ever asserted this authority concerning has been two candidates of the Peace and Freedom Party, Eldridge Cleaver in 1968 and this candidate in 2012. Both of them were African-American candidates for small parties. She has never asserted this power or this authority in any other context. We asserted that that raised an equal protection question at least worthy of doing discovery as to what the Secretary of State's actual motivation. In 1967, there would have been Marsh Fong Yu, probably. Who was the Secretary of State then? It was both. It was the same. In 2010, in 1968, it was a different Secretary of State, Your Honor. Probably Marsh Fong Yu, right? The Secretary of State forever. That's true, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. You're out of time. I'm going to reserve my last two minutes if I can. You have minus two minutes. I'm already past it. Sorry. My apologies. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll hear from the Secretary. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. 